Jose Pereira, he was wrongfully detained and held captive in Venezuela for nearly five years from November 21st, 2017 to October 1st, 2022. His only crime was that he was an American. Before he was taken hostage, he spent 35 years as an oil company executive and CEO of Citgo Petroleum, a U.S.-based refineries complex and broad gas distribution center. Today in the lab, myself, Jose Pereira, sit down, talk about his story from hero to villain here in the Business Athlete Performance Lab. Hi, I'm Keith Billis, and this is Live in the Lab. All right. A little bit of weirdness in front of the camera there for anybody who's watching, because I'm like, hey, where's the button? Where's the button? I can't get it going. How did you go viral on TikTok? You were on America's Got Talent. How much do you get paid to be on AGT? Oh, you didn't get paid. Keith and Steve here in Live in the Lab. You're a great interviewer. I love it. 48 miles, 48 hours. And not just once. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and I hit 50 last time, and I'm like, yeah, things are a little different than they were 10 years ago. So trust me, things are the key. You have no time for the BS that much yeah. of society seems to put on the table. Why is that? What you're talking about is real right now. There's just no bullshit here, but it's just real. We brought you in with some Marley. I said, Joseph, let's talk music for a second. You said, Keith Oldies, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I've never talked to a sir before. Why are you a sir? In many ways, we're the same story. I came from nothing. <laughs> You came from nothing. I think the old saying goes that if you want a trophy, you climb Everest. If you want respect, you climb K2. I've built an AI myself, and it's pretty fascinating when you can have a conversation with yourself with your own knowledge. Have you done that before? Why are we rushing to make these tools if they're all they're going to do is hurt humanity? Does the world need an Oppenheimer moment with AI? What a fun show. Hey, business athlete nation. The old saying where sometimes you just got to... Be patient before great things come to you. Something like that. That's the, cl it's the cliche in my head. <laughs> what is it? You got to be patient for great things? Is that what it is? Listen, I know we were patient today. Uncle Keith was trying some technical things on the background, and then, and I got the most extreme patience. My good friend, Jose Pereira, joining me here in a couple minutes. Been learning some new things. This AI stuff's changing the world, and it's happening so fast. It's just happening with post-production stuff. And I was like, hey, let's try something out. But needless to say, we are here, and I am excited and eager to welcome Jose Pereira to the lab today. It's not often you get to sit back and talk to somebody who was held captive. Honestly, have you talked to somebody who's been held captive before? Not for a day, a week, five years. Five years. W what is that like? Waking up, wondering what's next, wondering, is there a next? I, I, I don't know. I was introduced to Jose by Tara LaFon Gooch. A number of weeks back, and she's like, Keith, you need to meet with Jose Pereira. I'm like, all right, what's the story? She tells me a story. She wasn't even maybe three or four words into it. I'm like, I got to get Jose in the lab. Yep, we got to get Jose into the lab because we desire our aspiration here is to meet with some of the world's most interesting people. And it's pretty clear to me, the guy coming up today is probably one of the world's most interesting people. Perhaps the most interesting guy coming through the lab. So... I'm not going to have long monologue today. Nope, except for this. Nation, it's January. Yep. Jose, it's January. If you have some January resolutions, Jose, I'm reminding you, it's halfway through the year. It's January. So if you need some help to, to achieve those goals, we come knock on our door, we'll help you out. If not, you get six months to achieve those January resolutions goals. But you don't strike me as a guy that sat down in January and said, I got to get some resolutions here. But if you do... It's January, and it's that reminder that we're halfway through 2024. We're on our way to the end of the year, and hey, you got something you're looking to achieve. It's time to chop. It's true. All right. Jose Pereira is joining me here in the lab. What's shaking, Jose? Hello, how are you? How are you? Thank you for having me here. I'm fantastic. Thank you, and thank you for being here. It's uh, not every day I get the privilege to speak to a, a fellow with, with such a story that he brings into the lab. Well, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, let's start with this, my friend. Where are you joining us from today? I live in Houston. I'm Houston-based. Houston-based? You've been there whole life? Maybe there, maybe more than a decade. Uh, I came here. The, I, I, I'm Venezuelan-born. Yes. Venezuelan born, and I, I have been... 
from Venezuela and the U.S. back and forth all my life, but I came back to Houston like more than 10 years ago. And it's become home for you where you hang your hat? Base home, of course. It's home. All my family's here, my kids, my grandson, everybody's here. Yeah, that's exceptional. That's exceptional. So, Jose, where do we start? I, I look at the story. I look at the story. I, I was spent some time on your website, and I've been following you on my feeds over the last couple of weeks since Tara introduced us. And I came in today's discussion practically asking myself, where do I start? Such limited time, such a big story. Do I dive into the hostage taking? Do I dive into what Jose does today? I know Jose is a man of faith. He's a man of family. He's there's so many. You got a lot going on, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me how you want to be. <laughs> let's just dive into, let's dive into from hero to villain. You were kidnapped. Yeah. That's you taken hostage. You were held captive. Those, all those words that many people listening will not identify with. You identified with that label for over five years of your life. And then you live to now reflect upon it today. Can we start there? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, that From Hero to Villain is the title of my book that is going to be out this Friday. I'm going to do a launching uh, in LinkedIn. I'm going to do a launching virtual party this Friday. So the audience the, hearing this, I'm inviting everybody. I'm inviting the people to join with me. The, the, that is, for me, is a quite of achievement uh, after all this time. And I came back uh, and finally the book is going to be out. So that the title from here to be come from because of that because i did this a long career in the oil and gas and i was a hero in the in the venezuelan oil and gas in in Silco petroleum that is the u.s based company belongs to pdvsa uh, pdvsa is the venezuelan oil and gas company so literally i did my career between pdvsa and Silco. Mm -hmm. And I became the, the CEO of the company. So I was a, like a, a hero. And, and when this situation happened to me, we became the political pawns of the tension between the U.S. and Venezuela. And we became the worst of the villains because we were accused to be an American spy and, and had committed treason and corruption and embezzlement. And they put up a lot of charge. We became the, the worst of the villains. So that's why I decided to put that name from hero to villain. <laughs> But where did it start, Jose? When did you start recognizing the authorities or somebody was on to you or people were on to you or something was up? Or did it just happen instantly? No, it happened instantly because I was here in Houston. As I said, I live in Houston. And I was going and rewinding a little bit back. That story begins in 2017. So mm. that year, being here in the U.S., as I said, working to a company that belongs to the PDVSA that is uh, oil and gas from Venezuela, the Venezuelan regime, that is a communist regime, was having a lot of issues with the U.S. government. And the U.S. government didn't want to throw this guy out. So they began to impose sanctions that year. So when I began to see that back and forward, I said, hey, this is becoming ugly. I really, I was having the time. I had 35 years in the company. And I went, I flew and said, hey, my friend, I'm done with this. I'm going to get retired. And they accepted my retirement. So I was in that retirement mode. I flew back here to Houston, began to prepare all my stuff to get retired. And in November 19, I received a phone call, being, being in a movie with my wife, that I had to go to an urgent meeting to Venezuela. And I was ready to get retired. I, I said, okay, I told my wife, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be here maybe tonight or tomorrow back and packing my things to move on, and that never happened because we went to that meeting and in the middle of the meeting, this guy came with all these uh, apparatus of the counterintelligence police of that country and they caught us and they charged to be spies and committed treason and they put us the handcuff. Next time I, I saw light was like one year after and and we, that situation lasted for five years because we became the political pawns of the relation between the U.S. and Venezuela. Yeah. So for, for me, it was something totally unexpected. You're in a meeting. Doors open. The apparatus, great choice of words. The apparatus comes in, grabs you, and you're now done for five years. Oh, yeah. That's long story short, but it is, yes. <laughs> Five years, that's what, 1,500 some odd days. 
what 1775 days that's an official count 1775 1775 yes jose as you're going through day 300 day 900 when does it dawn on you that you were a political pawn in this whole mess or did you know the moment you were being apprehended and was it an aggressive apprehension jose or was it a delicate kind of okay we're taking you or was it an aggressive apprehension oh, they, that was very aggressive that was very aggressive they put us a handcuff they throw us in a armored truck and we did a tour of 12 hour and when we headed to the military basement we were placed in the military basement the situation went really hard for us because this guy really wanted to beat us and give them strong message that they capture us and they were gonna do wrong things if they didn't negotiate with them no the situation was terrible for us terrible i was in a total isolation the first year Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, totally isolation, yes. Because they, we were six guys and we were separate. They separated us and I was put in a place that they called the submarine. It's a vessel without windows, without fresh air, without water, no running water, and with lack of food and hearing the torture in, in the night. So it was a bad moment, yeah. How do you spend those days? Where, where did you find the strength to... to to make it through those 365 days in isolation by yourself? And what did you learn about that? Oh, I, I can tell you, it's very interesting, that question, because the first moments were really bad. I was having a lot of bad thoughts. I was even having suicidal thoughts because I, I learned after one month, I'm, I, I'm gonna try to be the most specific as possible because to tell you the truth, I love the sense of the time. So any time frame is like, a, I'm guessing, but maybe one month after, one day I, I I I knew that these guys were asking for us a lot, so they were asking to get lifted sanctions and get lifted the oil embargo, and we said we're left behind here, we're left behind because can you imagine what these guys were asking for us, and and then some months after we realized that the U.S. ambassador was recalled, so now we're in the situation they are asking a lot of things for us and now that US ambassador is recalled. So we really thought that we were left behind. And, and with those being accused of being a spy, you can stay there 40 years, I don't know. And But at some point I begin to think in my family, thinking that I really needed to come back to them. And like around 10 months after during that confinement, one day they opened the door and I had the opportunity to have a call with my wife. One minute call. One minute call, but I, when I heard her, she was telling me that they were fighting really hard to bring us back. So that that really made me that boost of hope that I needed to, to come back. Because I always say this, it's a situation where your mind is going all, all over the place. So it can be in the right or in the wrong way. And it's a choice. So I, I took the choice because I needed to come back to my family. So I took the choice to, to keep myself sane. And I begin to have more positive thoughts, always trying to have positive thoughts during the day. And one year after, we were put the, the six of us together. So that was for us a game changer. Now going back with my five colleagues, and now we are cheering each other. and. We, we found a lot of commonality with them, without all of us. And we create a bond. We create what we call a survivor plan. You were really treated like prisoners and it, it, you weren't, it didn't sound like you were treated as political pawns in the early days. It, it sounds to me like you were treated truly as prisoners, as in you guys were spies, we we're treating you bad, you're going into confinement. The problem with this type of regimes, because today I'm very aware of this situation because I'm connected to other American families that have gone through this situation in other countries. This is something called the hostage diplomacy. It's a very sophisticated way to do uh, diplomacy. What they do, they take you, normally you're a normal guy with a high target, high profile, so they, they target you and they begin to squeeze you 
try to break you because they want to leverage you. So they treat you, yeah, even worse than a prisoner, even worse, because they, they want to pass the message that they can do bad things to you. Because this is the only way this guy has found they can leverage their, their things. This is something that is being applied by the Russians, by the Iranians, by the Chinese, the Syrians, the Afghans, uh, the Cubans, and the, the Americans, the Canadians. Let's be <sighs> frank. No, let's come on. Listen, we can't just sit here and think that it's just, I, I don't. I got to think it happens everywhere. No? It can, happen. it can happen anywhere, but these guys, because these guys they have this line of thoughts, they do this like copy paste because they are copy paste. I have been talking with guys has been in, for example, in Russia and China or, or in Syria. And when I talk with them, what they do to them was exactly what they did to me. So it's a copy paste. This is like a manual. There is a procedure how they had to treat you. Was was Sitko fighting for your release? Was the government was all like you were gone five years? Did Sitko just go back to resuming operations and they knew they had a team stuck in Venezuela? And how how does all that work? Sitko belongs to the government. If the government of Venezuela was beating us, what can be the company doing for us? <laughs> yeah. So we were in the perfect storm. You must sit back today, Jose, when you look around the world and, and the shift to very, to, there's more autocratic regimes in the world than there ever have been. Democracy is defined differently for many in 2024. Yeah. You must look around and be horrified at what could happen to business leaders, to common man, woman, when you think about what happened to you. Am I incorrect? Of course, let me tell you, when I came back that I begin to, as I said, I begin to meet all these, because today I'm very connected to the hostage community here in the U.S. Yes. I know former hostage and families of current hostage. And I know all their cases because I have been talking with them. Yes. And are normal people. People that maybe high profile, maybe. Yes. Maybe they are like environmentalist uh, leaders or a uh, human right advocate or, 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 or a religious guy, but normal guys. So yeah, of course, it, it, it's terrifying that this can happen to anybody. I, this is what's fascinating to me, Jose, because I'm going to admit some naivety to you and nation right now. I've often, I've known why people have security and I understand why people travel the world with security. I know why Elon would travel with security or Zuckerberg would travel with security. But now I start to think about other high profile, influential business executives of nations who may have high profile or low profile security. There's a reason, isn't there? Because you go to a country that is quietly trying to gain some leverage on the United States. All it takes is capturing Keith Billis. And, and now the government of Canada has to decide they want, whether they want to get old Uncle Keith out of the country or not. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Friend, that is exactly true, my friend. And this is something that people are not aware, but um, for, I, th last year, I was invited to talk about this in the Congress, and I said that this is becoming like a national security threat because this is something that can target anybody. Yes. Anybody. And what is, and Jose, what, I think this is the right question, and I wonder if you need the answer. What is standard I don't know if there's policy. What, what, what's American policy when they're negotiating with, with hostage-taking nations like what happened to you? Do they negotiate or do they just turn their back and say, to hell with you? What's the policy? Let me tell you, that's a very nice question because do you recall the hostage situation in 1979 with the Iranians? Yes. Very, okay. Well, okay. During that time, the, the policy that you said, we don't negotiate with takers, okay? So there was, during years, that was the policy. But the, the situation began to evolve in 2019 was created a law and act called the Robertson Levinson Act. It's because a guy that he disappeared in Syria called Robert Levinson. By the way, I'm very honored that I know his kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. this, this guy, in, in honor of him, it is that, that that act has his name. That is that Robertson Levinson Act today is like the umbrella. To have the, the like the legal umbrella to protect somebody that's going through the situation. So, so that now officially the U.S. government can declare 
that you are a hostage and are wrongfully detained. When that happens, all the resource of the of the government gets up and then there there's today an office called the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affair, SPIGA. It's attached to the State Department. By the way, it has a rank of subsecretary of state and there is run by an ambassador. That way he was the guy who released that. His name is Roger Carter. He has the power, he has the all the tools today to negotiate. What is the hard call? Then normally the negotiations are difficult to swallow. Because what normally what the capture are asking are big things. Like for mm-hmm. example, as they were asking sanction relief. There were some guys that were re- releasing from I- Iran the last year. They were asking to get unfrozen a six billion dollar account. They can be asking to get to get the nuclear deal signed. They can be asking a lot. It's a difficult call. Mm-hmm. And normally this decision has to get the bipartisan agreement to agree that. Okay. So it's difficult. Right. So you need the Republicans and, Dem- and the Democrats to come together. You had Republicans and to agree that they want to agree that the U.S. government is going to fight to get Jose Pereira out of jail. Today, I, I can tell you that today are much more commitment. When the situation of us happened mm-hmm. seven years ago, we were the guinea pigs of the situation. Today, that I know how the situation has evolved, there's more commitment. There's yeah. more commitment. There are more foundations working in, the, in behind. There are more uh, government agents working in behind. There is a in the Congress a group called the Hostage Fusion Cell that it, they are is bipartisan that they take care of that. So there are more commitment because there has been more awareness that this is a serious thing to take to take care. That your time in captivity would have been during the Obama administration. No, it, it happened or- Trump during Trump. Oh, because it was 19. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. Yes. And, and let me tell you, Trump, Trump administration began to negotiate the release. Since day one, they were working hard. My wife went to the White House two times, and she went to meet with Pompeo and with John Bolton and with a guy called... There was a special envoy for the Venezuelan affair. But, so they, they, they really were taking care, but it's hard negotiation. Mm. And the- but it goes... But in that situation, it goes right to the State Department, right to the president's desk. Am I correct? So, 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 Trump, so Trump was, so at the time, the president of the United States, President Trump, was actively involved with the release of Jose. Although you were held captive for five years, Trump held presidency for four, you were released during the Biden administration. Yes, of course. When Biden took office, the, the good thing is that this ambassador, that I'm saying, Ambassador Carson, he was appointed by Trump, but Biden ratified him. Mm-hmm. Okay. He, uh, if you go back, maybe if you make memory and the American public make memory, mm-hmm. in April of that, the, 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 that year we were released, that year in April, we were released in October. In April, there was released a guy from Russia called Trevor Reed. Mm-hmm. Trevor was released in April during the, the in the middle of that. Ukrainian war. So when we knew that Trevor was released, we said, ah, oh, man, we're gone. If this guy was released during the war, we're gone. gone. And we, it happens. Six months after we were released. <clears throat> so this guy, he was appointed by Trump, but he was ratified by Biden. And I can tell you, he has been doing a wonderful mm. work. To be. He brought back Brittany Griner. He brought back uh, mm-hmm. a guy called Mike Freiros. He's working hard to bring back Paul Wynn and there is uh, still uh, Evan uh, Gershavik. There are a lot of people still left behind in other countries. Brittany Griner, you bring her name up. Was that, was there more, in your, from your POV, Jose, if I may ask, was there more to that than what met the eye? It's a difficult thing because sometimes when you're famous, maybe you get more attention to the press and this type. But I can tell you, she has been advocating very hard to that. After she came back to the hostage community, by the way, she t- today is an image of the Bring Our Family Home campaign, and she she wrote her book too, and she has been supportive. She has been really supportive uh, for for this cause because th- you become kind of part of a, a family, a family you never yes. wanted, but you become part of a family. I, 
I, I would believe that because there's very little people on the planet that can relate to your experiences. So when you can sit down with Brittany and somebody you've never met in your entire life, a complete different generation, so many differences where you probably normally wouldn't have crossed paths. Now right. she walks into the room and there's this instant connection, isn't there, Jose, where you knew ex exactly the kind of questions to ask her, she can ask you and there's a bond, isn't there, Jose? Of course, I went one month ago to a meeting in Washington, in one of these big foundations called the Jane Foley Legacy Foundation. They do their gala, the wicked gala uh, during May, June. Okay, so we I, I attended the event. There was a, a, a big crowd of people, and there were a former hostel. They were released this year. I met families of people that have their relatives still in the Middle East. People that have people in the Middle East. I met some guys that have people in Haiti. Some religious guys that are in Haiti. I didn't know that. They, so you begin to meet people that are going to this place, and then you make an immediate connection. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Jose, uh, my good friend uh, Christopher Keach is joining us here from uh, from Los Angeles today. He's my co-host on Mornings in the Lab, and he's got a great question. It's, Chris, you, you, Keach, you beat me to the question. It was next up on my list, too. What was your biggest revelation being in captivity for so long? Did you find a new purpose? And I want to add to this because I know Keach is a man of faith as well. Were you a man of faith before you went through this or did this faith help you get through this? So I guess a couple parts, right? What was the biggest revelation? Did you find a new purpose? And then how did faith, where did faith fit in all this? Keach, thanks for the question, brother. Oh, uh, Keith, thank you very much for the question because the faith is everything. <clears throat> I, I was a guy, I was not a religious guy. I was born in a Catholic family because I come from a Catholic country. Typical Catholic guy that goes one at a time to the church during the Sundays. Not a religious guy. <clears throat> when I begin to go through this situation where we put the six guys together, we begin to pray and we begin to read the Bible on a daily basis. And it really, did, we took it very seriously. So we did a daily Bible study we, we were studying the Bible and we rediscovered the Bible and now we're praying and, and doing the, those studies. And I, I said, man, you, you rediscover your, your spirituality and that makes you find your purpose because now you're, you become a man of faith because now you believe that truly God is going to do his thing to get you there, mm -hmm. out of there. And now you are really having that hope and, and having that strong faith. And, and that gives you a lot of strength and you find that the purpose that you need to come back to your family in, in, in one piece, but it, in soul and body and spirit. So that is a game changer. That's a game changer. And today I am very connected to my church. I do church service. So, so for me, that's uh, totally sweet in, in my life. When you're in captivity, seven years, 1,775 days, we often hear about people who've been kidnapped or have been held captive about Stockholm syndrome, where you become friendly or you find an attachment with the people who've hold you captive. You're spending 1775 days with these people that are holding you. During that time, was there any joy being you know, presented towards them? Was there always ill will? Did you hate them? Were, talk to me about the emotions you had not with your group. That's the next question. How is Jose feeling about his captors during all that time? I always was very focused about what was my situation. I tried to be respectful in order they can be respectful for me. As the time began to pass and the situation began to evolve, because remember, we were very tight how the relation with the U.S. was moving, how the negotiation with the U.S. Mm -hmm. were negotiation, they thought that was moving in the right place, they begin to relax that, that situation to us. That was a consequence. It was a direct correlation. So that doesn't mean that I became friendly with these guys. But I tried to be respectful and they begin to respect me with some respect too. So it was like, you're here, you do what you have to do, I'm here, I do what I have to do. And they begin to see us like we were, one day the director of the, of the prison came to us and said, man, from what planet you come? Because he saw us so committed. Well, we were doing exercise, we were doing this, we were cleaning, we were reading, we were 
praying done, we, we were reading the Bible. We were like a hamster doing things all the day. And these guys said, these guys are crazy. The crazy were them. We were really very focused on what we were doing. So when you got out, this may be a bizarre question, but I think it's fair. When you got out, at any point in the days following, did you miss that? Did you, and, and not miss it in a way that we, I think we traditionally would yearn for something, but was there something sociologically or physiologically or even psychologically going on going, I miss those seven guys, I miss the six other, my, my colleagues, I, and maybe miss is not the right term, Jose, but I'm really curious about the mental state of we're out, there's some joy in that, but then what is normal again, Jose? You begin to have some prison guilt, guilty because maybe I didn't say that beside us, there were two green barrets. They were captured after that, and they were our neighbors. So when I came back, I was always thinking in them. And what was my, my, my biggest joy that I met them back in Washington one, <sighs> one month ago. And, and I saw them with their fiance, with their wife, with their uh, siblings, with their fathers. And we take, it took a photo with them, but I was having guilty because we left them behind. And, and all the political prisoners of Venezuela that we were at, we left them behind. So you feel some kind of guilty. Jose, when you, uh, when you get out, when, is it the middle of the day or you wake up in the morning? Okay, guys, it's time to leave. I'm, I'm obviously having some fun with the moment, but take me into that moment. My listeners know I'm a big fan of the moment behind the moment and even further back. Have you wrestled from a, the, the, an awakening in the night? Is it just somebody coming to the door saying, okay, guys, it's time to leave? Or was there a buildup? Like, how did it end, Jose? Okay, let me try to put a narrative. One year before, in December 2021, we were releasing October 2022. So more or less, on 10, 10 months before, we received the first visit of the Ambassador Carson. He was author, authorized to do the first direct conversation to the, the, between the U.S. and the, the Venezuelan. So that guy flew to Caracas on a very quiet trip. And for us, it was a surprise when we received the, the, the message to get dressed up that somebody's going to talk with us. So yeah. now we saw this guy. He introduced ourselves, and we had a two-hour meeting. And he told us, all the negotiations that they were doing. And he said, we're not ready, we're here. And he came back three months after. Three months after, he said, hey, we're not ready, we're here. But that day, he took one of us. One of the six came back three months after. So now we're five guys. One is gone. Now our five guys, he came three months after in May, and he didn't take nobody. And we were shocked because he had talked Remember, I told you that uh, Trevor Reed was taken April. He, he flew one month after May. And then we knew that he already has taken Trevor from Russia. He came in May. We were expecting to get out, and he couldn't make it. Something happened in the negotiation, because these are things that they had to be very precise. Anything that goes wrong, everything's gone. So there was something that went wrong that I'm going to narrate in the book. And when that happened, the negotiation didn't happen. So now we're in May. Now we begin to be, get concerned. Oh, is this going to really happen? And then comes October. And when the day, the, uh, October 1st, they opened us the door. It was 5 a.m. in the morning. And they said, get dressed up. And we were already used to it. Every three months he was coming. So we really were thinking that the Ambassador Carson was coming. And when we were preparing, they said, no, get very the most best well dress up because you're free. When they said that we're free, we were like, okay, what's going on? Because you begin to think in a lot of things. But when we saw that we were heading to the Maiketi airport, we said, okay, this is happening really. And finally, we were released in a Caribbean island in the middle of the ocean called San Vicente and Granadine. Yeah, we landed in a Caribbean island, a very tiny island in the, in the Caribbean island. And because that was the place that the, the U.S. plane was agreed to come because we went through a prisoner swap. So they brought the two prisoners. They were the two nephews of the president of Venezuela. So we went through a prisoner swap in a Caribbean island. At this point, I have to smile and act ex 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 exasperated here because my friend Keech is saying what I'm thinking right now. Hollywood needs to make a movie on this. You got to tell me there's got to be producers knocking on your door or directors or somebody's got to be knocking on Jose's door saying, we got to make a movie on this. Or before you answer, or 
is it because this is so common? I hate to undermine it. Or is it because so it's so common hostage taking that Hollywood's, oh yeah, it's just another American held hostage. We don't want to make a movie on it. I'm obviously making light of that, but Jose, is, is Hollywood knocking on your door wanted to make a movie? I have a producer they, uh, working with me. They, there are two things they are working today. One is that he's working in, in a docu series. Yes. And the other is that I'm working in, in an anthology project with other three stories. There are four stories. My is one of, one of the stories. So these two projects are more or less going on. I'm not getting to steal to the Hollywood stage, but I believe that it will come after. You know? Okay, so then here's the most important question. I know that if Keach was here with me today, by the way, Nation, Keach is going to be back on the show Wednesday and Thursday morning, one of my co-hosts. Jose, we got a morning show. If you just, if you're really enjoying our dialogue, I would invite you to come check out at 8 o'clock Eastern time. You can spend an hour hanging out with myself, see Marty Fit, Chris Keach. We have engaging, accountable, fun conversation. I would love to have you back in the morning to talk more about uh, this whole thing going on, the, the, the book you have released and so forth. But Jose, you're... You get released. There's this joy. You're being swapped on some island in the middle of the ocean with a bunch of other people. I have to think that when you're on the plane leaving the, this island in the middle of the ocean to go back to America, this, this, well, this welling of, oh, my God, I'll say it, it's over. Was there tears flowing? Take me through this emotion where... It's real. Not the ride from the prison to the plane to the little island, but actually leaving the Italy little island back to America. Let me tell you, we were when we departed from the Caribbean island, we were told that we still had to stay tight because we needed to be sure in the American air. So now we're oh. still like two hours ahead. Those first two hours were very tense. Nobody was talking. Everybody was like waiting. Then when at some point the captain came out, I don't always remember the movie Argus. It was very similar. The captain came out and said, we're entering into American airspace and everybody went in tears. Everybody began to yell, to sing, to cry, to hug. It was like a celebration party. Dude, I just got goosebumps and tears in my eyes because I've seen the movie Argos and I'm envisioning that's what's happening on your plane. Because I never thought about the fact that you're right. You're not even in your, you're not even home airspace yet. You have to get back to home airspace before you're safe. They could, something can go weird during that time. You We're not safe. So that time frame that was like two hours was really tense. Was tense. No sh Sherlock, <laughs> and you can put the word in the middle there, nation, but wow, right? So the captain comes out, we're in American airspace. I'm just getting goosebumps right now. And now at this point, you must, it did the emotion. So you're with your, so there's five of you left in the plane, right? Because one person got left, got, was able to leave early, right? And we, and they took two more, because we, we, there were two more prisoners that came with us because they had a bunch of American. And another, yes. So the, we came back, the five of us, plus two guys that were in another prison that we never met them. So, yeah. we, they, so we were seven guys. They separated us into planes because one of the guys were really sick. Oh. And I think a lot of, I had suffering a heart attack. And, I, and there was a guy that what, tried to commit suicide. So the three of the guys that we were in the worst condition, we were put in a separate plane that was a hospital plane. We came in two planes. I came in a hospital plane and we landed here in a military base in San Antonio, Texas. And before that, because when the captain came and said that we were in, in safe in the American airspace, I, I was sitting with the ambassador and I said, hey, this is great. And he told me, Jose, the, the president has talked with your families and he already, he personally called our family. They did a Zoom call. And then he announced that we were coming back because at, at that point, it was a still secret. Yes, of course. It's still secret. So he, he announced that we were going back. And I told uh, the ambassador, can I talk with my wife? And he gave me the satellite phone and said, yeah, talk, call her. And I called her. And oh, I, man. But I called her and said, hey, I'm coming back. He said, yeah, the president uh, talk with us. He said, what are you going to do? Because I live in Houston and I'm going to land in San Antonio. <laughs> 
my friend, come to San Antonio. So when I came, when I landed, all my family was there. <clears throat> so when you landed in San Antonio, yes, the doors open to the plane. I'm thinking that there's no gateway. You're walking down to the tarmac because we're not some commercial airport, right? You're going down the tarmac. Where's your wife? My, it, it, my wife and all my uh, sons and siblings were in the hangar. Okay. But it happened. My, I had three grandsons. But the, my third grandson, he was born when I was in captivity. So I didn't know him. And he didn't know me, but my 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 daughter-in-law always was showing photos of me, saying, "Hey, this is your granddad." So when he saw me, he recognized me, and he began to run to me, and who received me really was my grandson. I had the photo when he jumped, and I I, I, I grabbed him because he recognized me. Wow. Woo! I gotta take a deep breath and just quell my emotion here because you got my emotion, Jose. I'm I'm very moved by this story, and I think anybody listening right now will be equally moved. Uh, I quit shaking, my friend. Hola, Jose. Saludos de Lima. Mike McQuinlan. Oh, okay. This is Mike. My, my, Mike is a friend that he lives in Lima. Yeah. Oh, like awesome. oh you, you know Mike? Yes, I know him. Oh, no kidding. Mike's gonna be on the show tomorrow morning. He's gonna he's coming in. To, we're talking grit. With the Mike McClellan tomorrow on Mornings in the Lab. So you'll have to tune in and, and check out Mike on the show tomorrow. That's awesome. This is just exceptional. I'm I'm gonna ask you this question, but then I would love if I was if I'm able to speak to these gentlemen. You speak about survivor guilt, and or I guess that's the word you talk about, right? There was some fellows that were taken out of prison before you were. I can't imagine what they were thinking, going, no, why are we leaving and we're leaving them there? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, I, and I can only imagine that they've had conversations with you privately saying, Jose, I'm sorry. Jose, I'm sorry that you had to stay while they took us. Am I right with that? Let me tell you, when the first uh, of our, uh, my colleagues, the first one that was released in, in, in March, the first that was released, I remember that we were in, the, in our cell and he was called to a meeting. And when he came back, he was like pale and was like in shock. And, and he said, I'm gone. I'm gone. And he didn't re reaction. So I remember that I began to slang his cheek and said, hey, my friend. He was beginning to put his uh, thing in his, his clothes. No, take everything. Leave everything. Go. So he was gone. He, when he was released, he came and he landed here in, in Houston at 3 a.m. in the morning. He came with an ambassador and Ambassador Carsten, the same morning, he had a meeting with the other five families because he wanted to see what was the reaction of the five other families. But you know what? All of us was convinced that he needed to be coming back for, for some reason, I'm not going to mention here, he had a, a very severe situation that he needed to come back first. Mm -hmm. so everybody was convinced. There was no no guilt. And by the way, after I came back, we had talked that. And he said, no, my friend. He called me when we were released. He called me and he said, hey, Jose, I, I, I always feel guilt that you were left behind. I said, no, no, my friend, you had to come. And then we're back. So now we're back, everybody. Jose, as we work towards wrapping up this conversation, I, I could chat with you all day. I, I, I could sit here and listen to you. I could sit here and be curious all day. I'm going to be disciplined and work towards wrapping it up, though, because I want to be respectful of your time. And maybe you've enjoyed this as much as I have, and you'll consider an invite to come back again. I, As you went through this experience and you look back upon it, I am a fan and I'm a man of humanity. I've never been more, fan, I've never been more in love with the human. What I mean by that is that as the world continues to separate and these silos of humanity pop up around us. I feel this mission and this purpose to bring us closer together and have conversations like this. As you've exited this part of your life, does that those five years of captivity make you hopeful hum for humanity, Jose? Or do those five years of humanity make you fearful for humanity? The problem that I see is that sometimes the, the humanity, I see things that I don't like what's going on in the world. But I, I believe in the people. I'm a guy that still believes in the people. I, I believe that, there are, that people are good in a sense. 
And I always think in that the people can become mean in the few in, in the meantime, but the people in a sense are good. And that's what I'm men of faith thinks. And that's what I think. I think the same way. And 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 I ask you that because during those moments, there is moments of fear, there is moments of the person, the, the people that were holding you captive are human beings as well. Yeah. Right. They've had moments of fear. They've had moments where maybe they were held captive by some bad guy. And I'm making some exaggerative points though, but it's, it was humans holding another human hostage, but there was so much more going along that, 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 that faith in you, I think helped you recognize that it wasn't personal, was it? Yeah, of course. And by the way, our captures, our, 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 our guards, these are normal people. They are yes. part of They're not good people. They're mean. They're they're like a Doberman. They can be very nice until somebody says attack. But uh, they are normal people. At the end, they are normal people. They're normal people, just like you are. Although I think, although I'm putting you, if I may, I, I think I'm putting you in the superhero category for the show, for a lab here. There's only been a few people come to the lab that in my POV have been superheroes. And by far and large, you are one of them. Thank you. <laughs> you are, because you've had experiences that 99.9% .9 of the population will not. And it's a very human experience. That, to me, is what makes you a superhero. Right? It's not about how much lift you can put behind the, the bench. It's not much you can squat. It's not how hard you can work when you go to work. That's not what it's about. It's about surviving for 1,775 days. What's going on? Well, I, as I said, I did it because I needed to come back to my family and the other side of the coin is what my wife and my family did. So they are superheroes too. Yeah. Well, they are much more superhero than me because they, they, I was there in the confinement going, they were trying to do things to bring me back all their life in pause, doing things, trying to work in anything possible to bring us back. They, 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 they are superheroes. I'm sure you and your family are thinking of this. But I would love to hear from your wife, whether it's through a book or whether it's through a show like this. I would actually, as a matter of fact, I'll put it out there. If you would come back with your wife or if, if you enjoyed this experience and your wife would it, it enjoy sitting down with me, I would love to have the same conversation with her through her lens of what it was like knowing her husband was held captive, negotiating with Pompeo, negotiating with Bolton, talking to Carson, talking to Trump, like all of that is really fascinating to me and I'm sure fascinating to our audience. So if that's a, of an option, I, I will throw the, the caveat out there that I would be, I, I would welcome your, your, your wife, uh, the other half of the superhero duo here to a conversation in the lab one day, Jose. I, I'm also encouraging her to write her own story. Yes. Story that really needs to be counted. Because you know what, As you, not to interrupt you, Jose, but there are many other husbands and wives many more wives probably of kidnapped hostages that would relate to her story that maybe need to hear from her. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and by the way, today is funny because in the hostage community, she, she's very well known. Everybody knows her. Everybody knows who she is because everybody's aware of what she did. So when we go to those events and that we are invited in that community, everybody knows who my wife is. She, I, I told her, that, wow, you're famous in this community. You know? <laughs> Jose, I'm going to put something on the screen right now. So from, from hero to from hero to villain, mm -hmm. we'll start that there. It is released on Friday. Am I correct? Yes. It's going to be Friday. I, I'm going to have the virtual launching party this Friday. So it's going to be in Amazon. It's going to be in Barca Nova and all the outlet. I tell the people to buy my book, not only because it's my book, because my book is not only my story, it's what I call my legacy. That is that anything in your life, you can go through a lot of situations in life, but really you can make it with a faith, with a hope, and with the love of your, the people that support you. Well, that's what I did. That's what I did. Business Athlete Nation, LinkedIn Nation, from hero to villain, Jose Pereira, I invite you to find his book. This Friday on Amazon.com, you'll get a chance to check out Jose's story. What an incredible conversation I've had with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed. Is there anything that we have not talked about? Is there anything you want to make sure that the audience knows about before we say goodbye today? You can go to my webpage and then we can find, you can find there. I, I do public speaking today. Anything 
they relate to the people. They want to invite me to any event. I'm open to that. I, I, I also have my coaching program, and, and now that I am becoming an author, I'm, I'm going to be promoting my book too. Fantastic. Jose Pereira, thanks for joining me today in the lab. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wonderful conversation. It's been a spectacular conversation. I will just ask you to wait in the green room for a quick second. I'm going to say goodbye to Nation and come back and walk you out, okay? Okay. Excellent. Hang tight. We're going to do this. I am going to, oh, I didn't have my music ready because you know how Uncle Keith needs the tunes rolling. So we are going to, there we go. No, that's not working. Anyways, all right, just those things today. Hey, not the time for music, perhaps. Jose Pereira, From Hero to Villain, this Friday, Amazon.com. If you enjoyed today's chat as much as I enjoyed it with Jose, I invite you to go check out his book. Check out his website, josepereira.com. You can find him on LinkedIn. He obviously does coaching. He's an inspiration of fellow. If you tuned in late, go back to the beginning, check it out. It is an extremely interesting, fascinating, 55-minute long conversation. This is not one of those soundbite chats. No, this is something you sit down and you listen. This is one of those conversations that digs deep into what I love, humanity. Nation, we'll see you guys tomorrow morning. Mornings in the lab, myself. Keech, thanks for jumping in today, my friend. Thanks for the great questions. I appreciate that. And for all you that tuned in live, because I can see a bunch of you out there today, I appreciate you tuning into the show. Tomorrow morning, mornings in the lab, we're talking grit. 8 o'clock Eastern time. We've got a live, we've got a live show here on, on uh, YouTube, X, LinkedIn, all the platforms you can find us here. We're talking grit and determination, and I'm sure Jose has something to say about that. Nation, we'll see you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I knew we can get the music working. So there it is. There's my music. Have a good one, guys.